Hello, good afternoon everyone. You are watching a UTSA Libraries virtual session. My name is Amy Bui. I am the librarian for Philosophy and Classics, the Honors College and the AIS program at JPL and also your co-host for today. I am joined by my colleague Moira McKay from Special Collections and Archives. She will be your main host. Um, in just a second, I'm going to hand the mic over to Moira and she will introduce our speaker. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to mention that I'm moderating the chat. So um, I'll be sharing resources. And um, after this thing is over, as it's obvious, I'm recording this. So after this is over, I will go ahead and send out the recording to everybody along with a list of the resources mentioned in the chat and the bibliography um, and list of suggested readings um, that the speaker has prepared for us. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, let Moira take over. So Moira, the stage is yours. Thank you everybody for coming. Enjoy. This is an outreach archivist for UTSA Special Collections and I am extremely excited to present Melissa Golke who is our assistant archivist and our resident LGBTQ historian. Uh, Melissa received her master's degree in history from right here UTSA and while working on her master's thesis, she began forging relationships with the local LGBTQ organizations and individuals as she worked to piece together the history of San Antonio's queer community. Um, she gained a strong appreciation for the importance of collecting, preserving, and providing access to local LGBTQ materials, a mission she pursues here at our special collections department. Uh, she's really our go-to person for all questions on the subject, and she's also kind of our resident expert on many of our LGBTQ collections because she had a hand in processing them or in gaining them for the archive, um, and also because of her background in historical research. Um, so if you have any questions about these this very large branch of history, she is the absolutely the person to ask in our department. Um, she also got a big start with archives when she was working with the Happy Foundation archives um, as I believe an intern. Um, she is also runs the Queer Days in Essay Twitter account, which posts local news and events and history from San Antonio that has to do both with our collections and with San Antonio as a whole. And you should definitely check it out. Um, but she's really committed to promoting the preservation of an access to LGBTQ materials held by local organizations and individuals. And I hope we get to hear more about it in this upcoming talk. So take it away, Melissa. Will do. Can you see my screen okay? The screen sharing presentation. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> So today I'll be uh, talking about a different narrative of San Antonio narrative uh, that's been largely ignored and hidden and um, creates an alternate way for us to view uh, a part of the city's culture that we really haven't heard much about historically. Moira did a really good job of telling you <laughs> who I am and what I do, and everything that she said is correct. Uh, when I decided to get my master's in 2009, I knew um, immediately what I was going to focus on, and that was local queer history. And I remember having this epiphany um, as I was at the Bonham Exchange one evening, uh, back in the days where I would actually go out to queer clubs, and I was standing up on that fabulous catwalk looking down on this uh, pulsing a crowd um, of folks from the queer community, and I thought, that's, I need to write about this, and I need to write about the history and how we came to be at this point in time. I am trained as an urban historian, 
and while I was doing my training, I was very focused on local LGBTQ history. I wrote my master's thesis um, on that history in San Antonio. And as Moira stated, I am the assistant archivist for special collections at the moment. Before I jump into my presentation, I do want to talk briefly about terminology. I use terms interchangeably. LGBTQ is perhaps the most used term that describes the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning uh, community. Then, of course, there's uh, the more extensive acronym that also includes intersex, asexual, or allied. However, I tend to use queer as an umbrella term. Um, for sexual and gender minorities, it's more inclusive of those um, on the, the gender spectrum. There are so many different ways of being, and queer is a term that embraces those different ways of being. So I'll use those, um, the different terms, plus the fact that it gets pretty exhausting saying LGBTQ all the time. It's, it's just a mouthful. So, all right, let's jump in. So today we'll be exploring uh, the city's queer past. We'll look at early signs of queer things, how those queer things were policed, bodies in queer spaces came under scrutiny by policing agencies. How did members of the queer community find safe space where they could ex escape that scrutiny? And then I'll talk a little bit about querying the archives. Early signs of queer things. Um, I found in my research queer things in unexpected places. We'll look at uh, vaudeville and how that was really a platform for uh, early queer identities. Within that context, we'll look at the curious case of Zelda Bunker. We will uh, visit a womanless wedding and then uh, investigate how the, the pansy craze swept across San Antonio. Early signs of queer things, this blushing, delightful <sighs> representation of femininity was none other than a female impersonator um, named Gilbert Cerrone. He was named the greatest female impersonator on the American stage, according to an article that appeared in the Express News. In 1906, Gilbert appeared in a venue in San Antonio known as Electric Park. You'll see on the screen there's a postcard depicting Electric Park. It was very much a family venue. It was named Electric Park because it was all electrified and lit up at night. It was right down the street from San Pedro Park and where the VIA uh, hub exists today. That's where Electric Park was uh, located. So Gilbert appeared at this family venue in 1906. And uh, reports were that his representation of the frailties of the feminine was amazingly convincing. There was another female impersonator known as Almond, uh, spelled like the nut. And he as well was very popular at Electric Park. What I find interesting is that gender transgressing as entertainment was very popular with local audiences. <clears throat> they packed into theaters to see these performance, these performers, and that included families. So this was not considered something that was fringe behavior. It was uh, simply a form of entertainment. That extended to um, male impersonators. Quite a few of them uh, grace the stages in San Antonio. We have uh, Hetty King and Kitty Donner, who both appeared in San Antonio. There was an ad for the Majestic in 1929 that featured these performers. It's important to note that most of the impersonators were very adamant about their heterosexuality. 
and they understood that there were social prescriptions against homosexuality um, that prohibited individ individuals from openly expressing their same-sex desires. So they really made it a point um, to, when they were not on stage, to dress in clothing, clothing appropriate um, to their gender. There were exceptions, however. And one of those was uh, a chap named Zeldo Bunker. So Zeldo's case is sort of singular in that uh, he appeared in the newspaper, but not in an advertisement for his performances at local theaters, but because of his disappearance. One day, Zeldo was seen storming from his boarding house in his shirt sleeves, brandishing a pistol. And that was it. He took off and disappeared. And his friends were very concerned. Uh, they, they just couldn't imagine what had happened to Zeldo and why he had left. He was, he was so popular. They went to his boarding house and they uncovered um, correspondence and notes from Zeldo. And you'll see the, uh, the quote that's on the screen. Zeldo openly is expressing his, um, his grief for losing uh, a, a good, a boy that he had treated so well over the years. His heart was broken. He had kept this person in luxury. And it, when this, this person left, um, it really has a, a very harsh impact on Zeldo. His heart was broken, the boy was to blame, he's someone he trusted. And so Zeldo being the very, someone who had a flair for the dramatic states goodbye to all, you will never see me alive again. Oops, sorry folks. What's strange about this is that the uh, goodbye letter from Zeldo is published in the San Antonio Light. And there's really no judgment expressed uh, in the article, but it's simply a statement of the facts that Zeldo has gone missing. His friends are concerned. Uh, they publish uh, the statement by Zeldo of why he's left. And uh, it's an odd thing to openly have correspondence of a man who is openly talking about what I perceive to be his homosexuality. This is taking place in, let's say, 1906. And um, it's, it's just a very unusual occurrence. Well, fortunately, Zeldo is found. He ends up in Joplin, Missouri with his sister and eventually ends up in a sanitarium for his mental health. Zeldo, prior to coming to San Antonio, his career was listed in the census as a clairvoyant. After he left San Antonio, his career in the census is listed as a clairvoyant. So clearly this was quite the character and uh, just a, a really interesting little tidbit that shows up in our local papers. San Antonio's social upper crusties, um, the women were frequent uh, attendees at vaudeville. Um, it was a place for someone who had a little discretionary and in time, uh, leisure time could go and watch performers like Zeldo and Gilbert on stage. And they learned some lessons from what was really popular with the public. One of the biggest lessons they learned is that female impersonation drew the crowds into vaudeville and consequently it drew the dollars in as well. So these um, well-to-do women decided to throw a fundraiser for, to raise money for Liberty Bonds. In uh, 1918, 
On April 7th, the Society page of The Light excitedly announces that there is going to be a womanless wedding coming to the stage of Beethoven Hall, which was a very popular concert venue, still exists. The event was put on by several women's clubs, and uh, they anticipated they would bring in a large crowd. The women recruited their spouses, or as I like to say, perhaps voluntold their spouses that they would be participating in this very um, fun and interesting event. As you can see in the picture, uh, it, it's, it's just a, a lovely, lovely um, gathering of the city's most prominent citizens. Attending were Adley B. Ayers, a famous architect, and he is playing the blushing bride. You'll see that uh, she is sitting on the lap of her spouse. Um, Texas State Senator Carlos B. served as the uh, mother of the bride, and or, I'm sorry, the maid of honor, and Harry Hertzberg, who is uh, seated and has this uh, little flower, flower ringlet on his head, uh, made an interesting mother of the bride. Harry Hertzberg, you may know, uh, is of the Hertzberg Circus uh, fame. And in this gathering was perhaps the only uh, homosexual, actual homosexual to attend uh, the womanless wedding. Fascination with female impersonation didn't end in the, the ni early 1900s. In the 1930s and four 40s, um, a thing known as the pansy craze swept across the U.S. Called the pansy craze because of um, the most visible, what a, a historian described as the most visible ambassadors of the queer and queer community of feminine men uh, were known as pansies, hence the pansy craze. This provided an opportunity, the pansy craze provided an opportunity for um, otherwise mainstream heterosexual individuals to sort of dabble through voyeurism and glimpse the lives of um, female impersonators. And oftentimes, female impersonators who were, in fact, uh, transgender. The pansy craze grew out of the Harlem resident, uh, Renaissance, where uh, big, big crowds were attracted to drag balls and, and nightclubs, and it was this open opportunity for folks to uh, glimpse and, and gaze into what was going on in the queer community, and that was true in large cities like New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco, but it was also true in San Antonio. Nightclubs such as the Night Spot uh, hosted female impersonators. One of them was named Hacha Hinton. She was very popular in San Antonio. As you could see, there's an advertisement from 1937 for the Night Spot, and it lists uh, the performers that will be there that particular evening. The photograph in the center is from the Zinc Graph Photograph Collection at UTSA Special Collections, and you'll notice um, on the right-hand side there is the marquee for the night spot where uh, Hacha was performing. Uh, the night spot was located in what would have been considered San Antonio's theater district, um, where the Texas Theater was, the Majestic Theater. So all these different uh, popular spots and nestled in there were uh, dinner theaters and cabarets that featured um, female per performers, female impersonators. Several years ago, um, a donor or patron of Special Collections brought in a souvenir um, brochure 
was doing a souvenir program from a club in San Antonio called the Gay Paris. And this came in just a couple of weeks after I had discovered through my research uh, the advertisements in the paper for female impersonators. So when Tom Shelton uh, sent over an email with this program attached to it, I just... I was so absolutely thrilled that we had more tangible evidence that this, in fact, uh, was something that was happening in San Antonio. You'll note on the uh, inside page, uh, there's Hacha, right in the center of the program. And the, I find, interesting point about the, the program, if you really look at it, that each performer has Mr in front of their name. So it's Mr. Lucian, Mr. Harvey Lee, Mr. Francis Blair, and so on. The exception to that is Hacha. Hacha Hinton was just known as Hacha. She was so um, determined to be seen as a woman and perceived as a woman that she simply didn't tell people that she was a man. And she dressed full time in women's clothes and did not want Mr. in front of her name. As far as she was concerned, she was a woman. The only exception to that was uh, when she uh, was dying, she did ask that she be buried in male attire so that there wouldn't be any problems. Um, in her final arrangements. Inside the program was a uh, souvenir photograph of Frances uh, Lee, AKA Minnie Myers. Almost all of the performers that are on this brochure were uh, based in Seattle. They were well known across the US and the fact they made it to San Antonio really uh, speaks to the popularity of this form of entertainment. So now we're going to look at how these performers and others who deviated from social, sex, sexual, gender norms were caught up in policing these activities. We'll look at how uh, performers needed to keep their performances in the clubs and what the consequences were if they didn't. We'll also uh, talk about how the military policed transgressive behavior. And then we'll escape to the country with queers fleeing the city in scrutiny. And we'll look at some of uh, the venues that existed outside of San Antonio city limits. Here we have uh, an ad from the Express News, 1935. And as you can see, it's featuring seven female impersonators and how this, this Great, a big draw for the Royal Dinner Club. The performers, however, didn't follow the rules. It was, let's say, an unspoken imperative that if you were going to be a man and dress in women's attire, you needed to do so on the stage and not outside of the clubs. When these seven uh, performers left the Royal Dinner Theater um, in their regalia, as it were, in their drag costumes, a resident of a hotel next to the club accused the performers of indecent exposure and called the police. The performers were arrested. They spent several hours in jail, during which they um, presented a drag performance for the other guests in the, in the jail. I thought that was quite creative of them. The DA's office couldn't find um, grounds on which to detain them, so they released the gals who agreed to leave the city. However, when the troop did, failed to pack up their gowns and move on, they were once again held on morals violations and charges of indecent exposure. 
Well, the performers proved to be more popular uh, in the courtroom than they even were in the, um, the clubs. There were so many spectators um, who were planning on gathering in the courtroom to witness this spectacle um, of female impersonators on trial. They were very disappointed when the court cases were, dis were continued. Uh, phone calls streamed into the court with locals wanting to know what the date would be when the, uh, the court the uh, case was uh, going to be in the courtroom. Uh, the case never came to court and uh, many straight citizens were very disappointed. They were not brave enough to go to the night spot or the royal, but they could have had a safe peek into this world of gender deviance um, if they could have seen it in a court of law. But alas, that did not happen. Policing of gender, uh, fluidity, deviance, immoral behaviors really ramped up during World War II. San Antonio had by that point become military city USA. The population of the city doubled from between the 1930s and 40s. It grew uh, from 200,000 to 400,000. And as we know today, as then, uh, it, San Antonio was a military hub. It's where uh, as many as two million soldiers passed through the gates of Fort Sam uh, for their training. Because of the um, great presence of military uh, throughout the country, and especially in military cities like San Antonio, the uh, government was very concerned, or rather the military was very concerned about the health and well-being of its soldiers. And um, that included their morality and their sexual health. There was a great concern about venereal disease, which had um, spread throughout the ranks in World War I in San Antonio. And so in World War II, when there were even more soldiers stationed here, it was a big concern uh, that soldiers be uh, warned about patronizing estab establishments where there might be opportunities to contract venereal disease. What you see on the screen is an off-limits list from 1945. This was put together by the provost marshal's office, and it's a list of establishments that were declared off limits in the city. And what that meant is military personnel, male and female, were prohibited from patronizing these, these establishments. You can see there are different reasons um, for the establishments being declared off limits, uh, body houses, uh, gambling, unsanitary, um, venereal contacts. Body houses and venereal contacts um, were indicators that there was homosexual activity going on in these places. This is not something that I stumbled across. It's, it's years of uh, digging by historians to figure out what the coded language meant on off-limits list and how we could interpret that as scholars of queer history and what that meant for homosexuals during uh, this time. Uh, prostitution uh, was certainly a big concern. San Antonio for decades since the 1880s had a huge red light district which was located where UTSA's downtown campus is. So unfortunately um, as that land was transformed um, all those wonderful old mansions that used to be brothels were raised to make room for other properties and now UTSA. So it's unfortunate. Perhaps we can do a little archaeological dig uh, at some point before UTSA expands down there. At any rate, the, the I, great irony of the off-limits lists is these lists were posted in barracks. They were posted outside the establishments that were declared off-limits. And as I have found out through a 
doing co conducting oral histories and talking to folks and and reading um, about uh, the history of these lists is that um, this was the quickest way for military um, personnel when they came to a new post to figure out where they would get needed to go to find other homosexual contacts and the off-limits lists were pointed the way so it made it uh, much easier than trying to uh, find places via word of mouth so it, the very mechanism that the the military created to deter um, homosexual encounters turned out to be the tool that queers counted on the most to find others um, of their inclination to uh, commune with. Despite efforts by the military to control um, venereal disease, the rates in the city uh, continued to rise and a health report in 1945 revealed that the majority of the infections weren't transmitted by prostitutes, contacts with prostitutes. They were transmitted via, an, uh, in quotes, casual pickups and friends, um, which I interpret as homosexual activity. Uh, sorry, folks. Very, very light mouth. Um, this is the off-limits list mapped out in San Antonio. You can see uh, where sites of queer activity were. Uh, the east, uh, east side of town uh, had an entire uh, section, an entire block uh, declared off-limits. And the proximity of that off-limits section of town to Fort Sam, it was just very close. It was easy for military personnel to hop on, take a cab or take a, a tram uh, down to uh, the side where they could visit these uh, questionable establishments. There was also an entire section of the river walk that was declared off limits and then the site of the former red light district um, where there was still prostitution was declared off limits. When the red light district was closed down in 1941, the prostitutes simply picked up their businesses and they moved to the east side, even closer to Fort Sam. So it really, in shutting down the formal red light district, it really did nothing to um, shut down prostitution in the city. So what did these spots look like? You see on the screen uh, two photos, the one on my left, perhaps your right, uh, of the woman who is perhaps participating in a fashion show. This is the Lifesaver Grill, which was on the 1945 Off Limits list. And if you look closely at the crowd, you'll see that it's a very diverse, racially mixed crowd. Such spaces uh, were havens for members of the uh, queer community. They felt uh, safe within those spaces. Um, clubs that were labeled black and tans were really a place where queers could go and be themselves and come together. San Antonio had quite a few of these clubs. Um, many were located on the east side of the city and therefore out of mainstream uh, San Antonio and perhaps uh, a little uh, off the radar of policing entities. The other photograph is of a very small bar called uh, Mary Ellen's Top Hat Bar. It was over on East Commerce Street and it was a homosexual hangout. It's a, a very small venue. A few years ago, a friend of mine from California who had grown up here or a bit lived here during the 60s and 70s made a visit back here to see if she could find some of the queer clubs she remembered. And one of the places we went was uh, the former location of the Top Hat. And amazingly enough, the building still exists and we were able to take a look at the interior and it's almost exactly the same. It's not a bar anymore, but it's it, 
uh, it houses a small contracting company. But it was quite a thrill uh, to know that this site of queer communion was still uh, physically existed in the city. It's unusual to see in this photograph um, a chap who's in military garb. Mary Ellen's top hat was not on the off-limits list. That does not mean that it didn't make the off-limits list in other years. But as a historian, I think that the location of the club and the fact that it was so small um, really may have kept it off the radar of uh, the MPs. But it did provide a sanctuary for queers in the city. There were other places in San Antonio that um, were important places of gathering for uh, queer San Antonians. The picture um, on the left with everyone crammed into the booth, that's at Mary Ellen's top hat. Uh, the woman uh, sitting in the white dress is Mary Ellen. Uh, Washington, she owned queer bars in the city for decades. and. Um, the top hat was just, as you can see, a place that of joy and, and being able to just hang out with your friends and be who you are. It, next to that is a club known as the Acme Bar, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Ac Acme and its location in a second. You'll notice that the patrons at the bar are very relaxed. Um, they seem to be enjoying themselves, having a good time. But notice in both these pictures, the women in the foreground are doing their best to stay out of camera shot. They don't want their identities uh, revealed. It's a good possibility they were in the military and were just out for a night of fun. But it was important that they not, God forbid, be discovered um, as being in a known homosexual hangout. One thing to note on the uh, picture of the Acme in the upper right hand corner behind the bar, there's a sign that says no dancing. And that's important. I'll talk about it in just a couple of minutes. Finally, we get some color. These are photographs taken by um, my friend Carolyn Weathers outside of the Acme bar. Acme was located on Austin Street, and Austin Street still exists. It's this little sliver just north of downtown San Antonio, and this was a very derelict space. It's kind of semi-derelict um, still at this point. The railroad used to run through there. Currently, it has some industrial buildings, but it also has some really... Um, nice uh, brick buildings that are in the process of being restored. One of them, I believe, has become an art gallery, Hilmi Art Gallery. But Acme um, and Austin Street were this microcosm of queer activity where men and women, gay men and women, could come together, hang out in this dive bar, and with very little fear of discovery, of police showing up. Um, and as you can see from the picture of Carolyn and her friend, it's, they're just very relaxed and having a, a great time. Unfortunately, um, the Acme was destroyed to make way for the I-37 and 281 interchange. So um, it would have been neat if those buildings were still around to be explored, but alas, they are not. For some individuals, like the women in the, the pictures that we saw previously, who were still within uh, clubs in the city, although they might be in derelict spaces, they weren't comfortable just being themselves and totally relaxing. So men and women, queer men and women in San Antonio felt a need to find places further out uh, where they could just break loose and not be as fearful of the police showing up with paddy wagons and packing a bunch of queers into them and off they would go to the jail. These images are of a club named Paul's Grove. It was way out on Culebra Road uh, in the country. 
and uh, out close to Holotus. So at that time, which is, this is the 1960s, that's out there, and there's really um, nothing else out there. Paul's Grove was essentially two repurposed army barracks, and there was a, a house on the premises and a swimming pool. So lesbians and gays who wanted to escape uh, the cons constraints of the city would say, I'm heading to the country, and their friends would know they were going to go out to Paul's Grove. And they could go out and spend the weekend. Lesbian couples often brought their kids. It was very um, family friendly for queers. You could hang out by the swimming pool and just really have a good time. Unfortunately, in uh, the early 70s, uh, the house on the property and some of the other buildings uh, were burnt by a fire, burned to the ground by a fire, and that was the end of Paul's Grove. A very sad thing for folks who depended on uh, having that um, escape to the country. But it was so, it's so iconic that people I talk to who went to the country have such fond memories of this venue. One of the things that made it so special is that same-sex couples were allowed to dance at the country. And that was very unique because in the city there was no dancing, as you recall, at the Acme Bar. So it was really a big deal. On the rare occasions that the country was raided, uh, the owners had devised a mechanism to warn their patrons if they saw the police and the paddy wagons pulling up, they would flip a switch that uh, lit, lit a red light over the bar and patrons knew that they needed to scramble and get a partner of the opposite sex. So oftentimes they thwarted the police. There was another venue uh, outside of San Antonio. This was way out on Fredericksburg Road. Um, it was a lesbian um, retreat called Klein's. It provided a really rustic uh, place for lesbians to go and just hang out, opportunities for intimacy, hanging out with your friends. Um, the proprietors of Klein kept the cops at bay by paying uh, the police to stay out of their establishment. So that made it um, really a safe space for queer women in the city. Klein's, interestingly, was um, listed in a publication uh, known as the Lavender Bideger, which was uh, distributed throughout the U.S. and listed by state and city uh, where there were queer places that uh, lesbians and gays could go to, and Klein's made the list. Unfortunately, there was no address associated with it. There's one more establishment in the country that I want to talk about, and I'm going to read this quote because I think it's just so fabulous. It's by um, John McBurney and was published in, uh, out in San Antonio. The bigger the hair, the closer to Jesus, we used to say. The Ponderosa was a place where raw talent went to bloom. They created stunning outfits with headdresses, sequins, feathers, ruffles, and wigs. They pushed fashion to its limits and made no apologies. It was very liberating and very innocent. They were unaffected by the outside world, lost in the moment. These are the folks that he's, John's talking about. This is a club called the Ponderosa. It was down in Von Orme in the late uh, 60s, early 70s. And it was in a repurposed army barracks, which seemed to be the popular thing for queer clubs, just because it was this cavernous space, perfect for drag shows. According to informants, you would never know. You, you had to know someone who knew about this place to be able to find it. And you would never know from the outside what you were walking into. This is fabulous as far as I'm concerned. The, the gowns, the, the silver lame, the wigs, the performances, the disco ball, the stage. This is out in the Texas country, just south of San Antonio. Who'd have thunk it that these incredible drag performers found a space in which to start their careers, and many of them did. They moved on to bigger cities. This particular performer is Carlos with a K. 
He is known as one of San Antonio's great eccentrics. If you ever uh, Google his name, an article from out in San Antonio will come up, and it's worth a read. He's just, he's amazing. Um, the picture of him with the crowd in the background is at the Ponderosa. As you can see, again, it's a very diverse crowd. And in San Antonio's other places, that really tended to be the norm, is that you, you open these spaces up to a diverse array of people. And if you look at the faces of the, um, the audience watching him, they're just enthralled with his performance. Carlos, in his fabulous blue outfit, performed also at the Zoo Club, which was in San Antonio, a club owned by Lolly Johnson. Um, this particular image of Carlos at the Zoo Club is from the Lolly Johnson papers at Special Collections. The Ponderosa photographs are in a private collection owned by John McBurney. Hopefully one day, maybe it'll make it to us for safekeeping. We'll see what happens. So finding safe space in bars um, was really important. And as you can see that in the country, there were some spaces where queer and men and women really could feel safe. Um, they could just kick back, enjoy themselves. Um, lesbian bars became sites of feminist um, sort of introspection and discovery. And then we're going to just briefly look at how there's this proliferation of queer spaces um, in San Antonio during the later decades of the 80s and 90s. This again is the Zoo Club, which is the club uh, Carlos with a K performed in. It was really uh, a women's club, a lesbian club. And often um, lesbian clubs, there were several in the cities, uh, were spaces where women could come together and really talk about emerging feminist identities and what it meant to be gay and be a woman and be part of a woman's community. These two pictures are of uh, other clubs. Uh, club life in San Antonio circa the, the late 1970s, uh, both were Lolly Johnson's club. She's the blonde in the middle with the beer. Uh, she had, I believe, seven clubs over several decades. But I love these pictures because they really capture the sense of camaraderie and happiness that um, these kind of spaces engendered. Um, a very iconic bar in San Antonio was the San Antonio Country. Um, it existed in the 1970s up through the early 80s. It was downtown on St. Mary Street. And it was this, apparently for what I'm told, this huge bar that you can see the interior is just set up for relaxing and, and casual conversation and folks coming together. Um, I had a, a, a chap that I interviewed when I was working on my master's thesis. He went to the San Antonio country in the 70s, and he said when he first walked in, it was the first time he knew he had found a place where he could be himself. Uh, he ended up meeting his future husband there, and um, they had been married when I spoke to him for 37 years. So that's, that's quite a memory. When he spoke about the country, it brought tears to his eyes. So it's really a very important space that existed for many people in San Antonio. Uh, these maps were put together um, by me when I was working on my master's thesis. And the, the little push pins in there um, are marking uh, gay bars and gay establishments. And you can see that in the 1980s, they're really starting to cluster along the central corridor. That is St. Mary's coming up out of the city uh, onto San Pedro, Main Avenue, where we now have a concentration of clubs. And then by the 90s, things have really coalesced. Um, in that same area. However, that being said, you'll notice on both maps that there were clubs outside 
um, all over the city. So no matter where you lived, if you lived close into downtown, if you lived in the neighborhoods just a around downtown, or even if you lived out in what were the suburbs, there was a place that you could go. This is uh, the interior of one of the clubs, the Broadway Cabaret, owned by Lolly Johnson. Uh, they had fabulous floor shows. Uh, the photographs depicted here are in Lo the Lolly Johnson papers at Special Collections and really just um, delightful to look at. Uh, the Marilyn Monroe performer featured here is a chap named Jimmy James. He got his start in San Antonio at the Broadway Cabaret got his path to fame when he went on a talk show called The Phil Donahue Show. Uh, some of you are probably too young to remember that, but <laughs> during the 70s and 80s, there was just this, this proliferation of daytime talk shows and drag queens were very popular. After that, Jimmy James went national. He's still performing today, which is awesome. So to wrap it up, I'm going to talk a little bit, little bit about querying the archives and um, what, what's going on at Special Collections, how we get collect, uh, LGBTQ collections into the archives, and the collaborations we're able to forge with community partners. This is um, just a brief statement on our vision, our mission, and our collecting priorities. And LGBTQ materials is one of our top collecting foci, which I am delighted about. Oops, skip one. This is the inside of the archives, if you've never been in one. This is just one of the aisles that we have at our annex, where we house our manuscript collections. And in these boxes, there are some pretty remarkable treasures. Sorry, folks, my screen just went. Give me just a second. Get out of there. Go, go, go. Ah, back on track. I am not below or above um, a little, what's the word, self-recognition. But I, I say that in jest. In 2015, I know that's five years ago, so Melissa, you know, get over it. It's a while ago. But the reason I keep this picture in here and I reference this, I made the most influential list in out in San Antonio, which are, is our local queer publication. The importance to me of, of making this list was not about me but it was about the recognition of the work that we do at Special Collections and the fact that we have prioritized collecting queer materials. And the fact that at that point, the community was really becoming aware that, hey, we want your stuff. We're collecting this history. It's important for us to bring it in and preserve it. And it was really a good outreach opportunity for us to um, reach out to new donors We have, uh, through our outreach, made some fantastic collaborations. We partnered with the uh, Digital Transgender Archive to uh, share with them our, uh, some transgender materials, the Linda and Cynthia Phillips papers, the um, Victor Lopez and Rudy Cardona photograph collection, which are photographs of Cork Corpus Christi drag pageants in the 1990s. Those are all digitized and online if you ever want to take a look. They're really awesome. And then issues of uh, transgender publications from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Another collaboration was with the Wearing Gay History uh, project. And uh, we took photographs of the t-shirts that we have in our collections, LGBTQ t-shirts, and they are now part of that international database. It's, it's remarkable to think that that t-shirt that you had, were planning on throwing away is actually a historical object. So think twice before you throw it in the dumpster or donate it. One of our most um, memorable collaborations was with Gene Elder at the Happy Foundation. And uh, we partnered with him to digitize 
uh, all the local LGBTQ publications in their holdings. And Gene um, also donated all his personal journals to UTSA Special Collections several years ago. And those are accessible to the public. So really an important uh, partnership for us. And then lastly, in June of 2019, I think personally one of um, the most important uh, partnerships that I was able to participate in was the uh, Trans America American exhibit at the McNay. We had our own gallery space uh, for our exhibit called Trans San Antonian. We were able to showcase our transgender materials. The exhibition in total brought in over 30,000 people and was extremely successful, won um, several awards and uh, was just really a nice way for us to uh, expand um, accessibility to our collections. I have at my time with a minute to spare, so I'm just going to say thanks so much for listening. I hope you thought it was informative um, and that you learned some things that you had no idea about San Antonio's history. I am happy to take any questions if you have them. All right, so at this time, we're going to go ahead and take questions. I'm sure you've noticed it's already almost 2 p.m. So if you need to take off our meeting, go ahead. We are recording this. I can send out the recording later. But if you want to hang around with us, uh, we will be, <laughs> we'll, we'll just stay around here and we'll uh, be answering questions. So um, you can go ahead and paste your questions into the, the chat box if you want. Um, we're just going to give everybody a few minutes to see if you want to paste anything in. Uh, okay, so we have one question, um, and that's um, Melissa. I would like to hear discussions about unique challenges of people in both LGBTQ and the Latinx population. How or did religion and or notions of family play a part in their intersectional struggle? Is that reflective in the literature? And were there instances of activism in that community? The only part of that question that I can speak to is um, instances of activism as uh, collections that we hold mm -hmm. that uh, depict that. Um, San Antonio um, Salga, San Antonio Lesbian Gay Assembly uh, was very much a Latinx focus um, activist group. And the materials that are in there um, are very focused on uh, that community. Uh, one of the women's organizations, Diego, was in there. Um, as far as the other components of that question, I think that's a little beyond the scope of my ability to answer um, at this point. Okay. Okay. Do we get any others? Oh, uh, another one. So what was the main reason for the stigma against LGBT plus growing in San Antonio? Was it mostly World War II or were there other causes? Stigma was very pervasive for um, decades that pre preceded uh, World War II and certainly decades that uh, were beyond World War II and sort of letting up with gay liberation in the 1970s. Um, the piece in, in World War II, it was really focused on um, monitoring behavior and making sure everyone towed the same line. And that was true of moral and sexual behavior. So, um, and then of course the physical health of military personnel. But uh, military, um, the military is very much about controlling behavior and ensuring that um, everyone is performing at their 
their optimal um, at all times. So I think it's, it's a very complicated question. There are uh, books that really deal with how the military interacted with homosexuals. In San Antonio, there were a lot of raids on local bars by M MPs. Um, they intentionally were going in there looking for military personnel. So there's, there's more information on it, and I can, if it would be helpful, uh, provide a bibliography of sources that might be useful to folks. Oh yeah, I can share that out along with the recording once I have that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Melissa, you know the um, the photos you were sharing. I know some of them were in the the collection, um, so I tried to link to those. But for the ones that aren't, uh, are they accessible anywhere else, or are they just um, in private collections? Yeah, the Ponderosa photographs are in private uh, private collection. And as far as I know, they're not digitized. I just happen to have a colleague um, who visited the collection share those uh, with me, um, hopefully through some outreach and uh, lunches maybe <laughs> down the road. Um, the, uh, the individual that holds those will be interested in donating or at least loaning them to us for digitization. Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. When it can were... be a long process. I imagine when you were making your map um did did you use like a large variety of sources or was it mostly hearsay or like kind of when i was making the maps yeah um you, like i used i researched the location of all the bars and businesses. I have a spreadsheet that's um, available in the back of my, my master's thesis, and I, I can include um, the title of that. It's in ProQuest. Um, there's a spreadsheet that lists out the addresses of all the bars, how long they were in business, businesses, etc. cetera. Um, just uh, talking to people uh, about uh, the bars and businesses. Ultimately, my hope is to turn that into an interactive, those into interactive maps. They, they are in Esri ArcGIS at the moment. And uh, I would like to eventually add uh, photographs uh, perhaps some oral history recollections, um, advertisements from the local queer pubs. So that's a project on the horizon I'm really excited about. Um, those were created as a practical way to display uh, expansion of the queer community when I was working on that particular thesis. Very cool. Sounds like an exciting project. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any last minute questions? Um, I'm going to go ahead and share Melissa's contact page here in case anyone has any questions for her that um, they want to ask directly. Yes, please, please feel free to contact me via email. I'm always happy to chat. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, um, you know, I guess if we don't have any more questions, do you have any closing remarks you want to make, Melissa, before we go? Just thanks, everybody, for hanging out and listening. And I could see from the comments that y'all enjoyed it. So it's a great way to spend my afternoon. <laughs> so I appreciate it. But please, if you have any questions, send them my way. Thanks for hosting it, Amy and Moira. And, um, yeah, awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm going to, like I said, send out the recording after this, and I will also send out the, the resources that Melissa wants to share with you. And um, I, I also will probably link to some kind of like survey so you could enter like your feedback. It'll just be something really quick, probably multiple choice, but just so you can <laughs> so we can see how we're doing. Uh, but yeah, all of that will be coming in an email probably like in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, thanks for joining us today, everybody. And um, we will... See you around. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now.